welcome to Castaways with myself, Betty Clark, on Dundalk FM. Castaways is a programme where each week my special guest, the castaway, will be on a desert island. While there, they've chosen the next eight songs to bring with them. I'm going to give them a copy of the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. They've chosen a book to bring with them and a luxury item. Together we'll talk about these choices and their lives so far through music. So let's cast away. You're very welcome to Castaways with me, Betty Clark, on Dundalk FM. Castaways is a Desert Island Discs show and today my very special guest is Anthony Murphy from Mythical Ireland. Hello Anthony, how are you doing? Good morning, good afternoon Betty. Good afternoon. How are you? So tell me, you've come all the way from Drogheda. Yes. Down here to Dundalk. Long old hall these days. It is. The M1. Like... Took 18 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about yourself and Mythical Ireland. What is Mythical Ireland? What's that website? Well, well, mythic- yeah, well it's a website. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, I suppose, the sort of culmination of a, a, a long number of years of research into Newgrange and the ancient monuments of the region. Um, in the context of, you know, many different things, astronomy and alignments and mythology and maybe sort of the spirituality of the people who built them and sort of looking at many different aspects. And it's just grown into sort of a a much bigger thing over the years. It just started it as a website in the early days of the internet, a fledgling sort of way of putting the information out there. And... Um, the audience has kind of grown kind of almost exponentially since then, you know. And um, tell me what what year we're talking about uh, it, when you say... Well, Mythical Ireland was set up in March of 2000. So it's on the go over 16 oh, years. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've quite a big following. I've seen that on Facebook. You've, you've something like 10,000 followers. So um, probably lots of people listen to this from all over the world, actually, online. Because well, hopefully, yeah. I did put it up on this morning. Um, we've passed 17,000 likes. Oh, my God. As oh of God. last week. So, yeah. it's it, as I say, it continues to grow. And I think yeah. that growth is indicative of people's fascination with the whole area of prehistory. It's quite mysterious on the one hand. I mean, we know a lot about the sites and that from the archaeological record and from the material record, but it's filling in the gaps in terms of, you know, what what were the people like who built it and what did they believe in? That seems to kind of really sort of grip and fascinate people. And especially today where people are trying to maybe make a connection with that, you know, um, across the ages, because, you know, today I think people are looking for something. And what year are we talking? Are we talking pre-Christ, pre Christ, pre pre B C. I mean, we just be, I'm a child here, so tell me this. When we say Stone Age, and uh, uh, well, Newgrange, Nowth, and Douth would have been built approximately five and a half to five thousand years ago. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. So yeah Newgrange has been dated to around five thousand. 150 years old, 3150 BC. Oh my God, that's awesome, isn't yeah, it? Well, yeah, well, if you think yeah. about it, the entire period of human history since Christ is just over 2,000 years. And we're, we're actually talking about that plus another 1,000 years in addition. So, yeah. So these were people, Irish people, who built these uh, monuments. Irish is an interesting uh, concept because, you know, there were a lot of people coming into Ireland after the Ice Age and that continued up until the time that farming arrived on Ireland's shores which is really when these big monuments began to be constructed is when um, we had an an influx of people and a sort of a, a, a new way of living so we'd been used to this Mesolithic lifestyle, um, you know, hunting and gathering and fishing for your food. And and suddenly there was this transition. Well, we don't know whether it was sudden or not, but there was a transition to uh, a farming lifestyle which enabled us to build these big monuments. But to say they were Irish is interesting because, you know, if you go back 10,000 years to the end of the Ice Age, there were, there there was no population in Ireland at that time, whatever people had been here were 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 either you know wiped out by the 
the, the ice age or a fled as a result of it. So um, we're really continental. We, we have our origins on the continent. Um, okay. You know, that's farming uh, started in the in the Middle East and, and moved across Europe. And I think Ireland was pretty much the last country to adopt it, you know. OK, well, that's all very fascinating. Um, on this show, we're going to we've given you a choice, Anthony, of uh, going to stay on a desert island and you've picked eight songs. So we will get back to um, the um, the history of the whole um, mythical. We could be we could we could do 10 hours on that. We certainly but could, yes. Your first choice uh, of song today was I thought was lovely. It, it's a it's a. It's Dire Straits and it's Romeo and Juliet. And I was very touched when we, when I saw that you had written that you fell in love with your wife, Anne, and you used to sing this song to her. Yeah, very badly, it has yeah, to be said. Yeah, and play I, I the mean, guitar. I'm a deplorably and... bad guitar player. I mean, I'm a good euphonium player, but a terrible singer and a terrible guitar player. You yeah. know, awkward and missing. But she still married you, so she must have. She, yeah, I think she was just <laughs> impressed by the whole sentiment of it, you know. But I love the song because it's it's um, it's a sort of a, a modern take on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, okay. you know. And uh, thankfully she didn't, I mean, in the song, you know, Juliet was kind of, Romeo was trying very, very hard, you know, to, 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 to impress Juliet. She's really not that impressed, you know. So thankfully, in my case, Case. You had better Despite luck. Despite my shortcomings, I had better luck. Yeah. Well, this is especially for Anne. And let's hear Romeo and Juliet, uh, Dire Straits. Talks like the talk on the TV, and I can't do a love song like the way it's meant to be. I can't do everything, but I'll do anything for you. I can't do anything except be in love with you. And all I do is miss you, and the way we used to be. All 
I do is keep the beat The bad company And all I do is kiss you Through the bars of a rain Julie, I do the stars with you Anytime Well, apologies there for fading back on Dire Straits, but we, we have to get to talk to this most interesting man, Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Anthony, um, tell me about the Dundalk connection. Oh, yeah. Uh, my father's uh, parents were both from Dundalk. Um, his, his father, James Murphy, was from Muller Harlan and his mother was Bridget Travers. And the Travers would have been very well known for a long time in Dundalk. They were cobblers based in Bridge Street, and uh, they would have um, they would have done the shoes for all the religious orders in the town. They would have been very very well known, kind of far and wide. Um, now the thing is that um, my father was born in Drogheda uh, because th- um, my grandparents moved to Drogheda shortly after my uncle John, who's uh, my late uncle John, who was a priest. Shortly after he was born, he was the first, and uh, they moved to Drogheda. So he was born in Drogheda, but always sort of maintained a sort of a strong, strong connection l- linked to Dundalk. Mm, yeah. Mm. And Anthony, you're you're a writer yourself. You've written books and you're a journalist, aren't you? Yeah. Um. I suppose I followed. The f- my father is uh, has been for his entire l- life a uh, newspaper journalist, and I sort of followed into the same career. Um, because when I was leaving school, um, you know, I had my s- sights set on being a writer, and I felt that journalism would be the ideal career in terms of trying to sort of segue into that. Because you don't just write a bestseller when you leave school and suddenly make a living from writing. In fact, I, I've written four books and um, I, I'm not making a living from them. Uh, not yet, anyway. You know, we just keep plugging keep away on. and hope yeah. that that happens eventually. So I've been in newspaper journalism for the last oh, 22 years mm. or so. Your father was in the Drod Independent, wasn't Correct, he? Paul, yeah. Paul Murphy. He was the editor there yeah, for 16 yeah, years, yeah. 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 And you worked in Dundalk yourself in, in Dundalk? Yeah, I was, for five years, I was the editor of the Dundalk Democrat newspaper, which is um, still on the go and was uh, it was a very sort of ancient institution in terms of, I think it was founded... Uh, in the late 1840s um, and uh, had very strong ties in its early years to, you know, the Land League and the the whole sort of home rule struggle. Um, and so I was the ninth editor of the Dundalk Democrat until 2012. And now you work in Dublin. You're in, uh... Yeah, I'm working for the Irish Farmers Journal now. I'm a sub-editor and graphic designer. Um, and they, the... I also work for the Irish Field, so the two papers are um, put together in the in the same in the same place in Dublin. And you particularly like music. You said that it it helps your energy and your um, you know different. It can change the mood of a person. Yeah. Um. You felt even with writing yourself, you like. Yes, and this is a this is a discussion that go, goes on actually in the background in writers groups and online. In uh, in authors forums about what kind of role music plays, and for me, it, yeah, I, I find that uh, playing a certain type of music helps me with my writing. Um, it can it can it can be quite a stimulus actually, but it obviously depends on the type of music. But I mean, I think it's been scientifically proven that um, music affects your mood, and that in fact, um, music can help you to study if you listen to the right type of music. Mm. It can help mm. you to concentrate, and it can help cure, or at least help you with issues like anxiety and depression, etc. So, uh, music is really sort of a universal language. I mean, if you could communicate a mood or a scene to a person, you could do it very effectively with music in a way that maybe language you know doesn't reach well maybe these boys uh, your next choice of song you two where the streets have no name they've managed to do just that i think uh yeah i i i i really love this song i always loved it from the first time i heard it um i, I have to preface this by saying that you know i was a big fan of you two um f- when you know f- until around the time that, uh, that they produced The Fly and from then on I think they went on a different path but I'm a big fan of their early music and I think that their early music captured a lot of the sort of angst uh, of the sort of whole uh, Irish scene back then you know we were emerging from a, a very bad recession in the 80s uh, we had the troubles in the north 
and we had there were a lot of things happening globally and I think you two just sort of came along and sort of captured a lot of the atmosphere of that time and the reason this song is sort of really really special to the Irish scene is that um it, it, it's it's about two things it's about Belfast and the fact that if you said you were from the Falls Road that had a connotation that you know if you said you were from a particular street or a particular part of Belfast that meant you were a Catholic that meant X, Y and Z if you said you were from the you know uh, the Shank Hill or somewhere else that meant another thing entirely and um, Bono and his wife had been in Ethiopia in the early 80s and there, there was a total anonymity in terms of streets. It didn't matter where you, there was no real identity with what street you grew up on. And he says that really it's a comparison between the two. So, you know, it, it sort of plays out too in modern day uh, Drogheda and Dundalk and the whole rivalry between the two towns when really we're so close together and we've so much in common that we should be best of friends, you know. Well, let's hear where the streets have no name. Was lovely. You're welcome back to um, my chat here with Anthony Murphy on Castaways. Um, Anthony, we were just ta- talking there. The Drogheda Brass Band is a very big part of your life. Massive. Massive. Yes. Yeah. I, I kind of got involved there as a kid um, when the Drogheda Brass Band started its school of music in the 1980s and wanted to kind of get kids involved in music. And I've been involved. Well, I had a break from it for a few years when, when the kids were really young and Life was very busy, but I've been involved there on and off since the mid-1980s. 
And uh, it's huge, yeah. And one of the... Your th- children are involved as you well. You see, that's it. It's yeah. kind of come full circle now because... Um, How many children have you, have you well, Anthony? I have five kids. Five kids. And they're all involved now. Oh, that's um, brilliant. The they all play music and they all... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So four of them are in um, both the senior band and the youth band. And then my youngest, Finn, he, he he's just started in the School of Music, so he'll be progressing along hopefully in the next couple of years into the youth band. So what age is he? He's uh, he's going to be eight in October. So okay, he's, he's okay. Nearly eight, and yeah. they all learn how to play, how to read music and play it, and it's, it's yeah. a great grounding for it's them. I'm wonderful. sure. Wonderful. And yeah. you know what's really lovely about bra- brass, a brass band is that you encounter every, almost every different st- style and type of music possible. So people sort of wonder, well, what do you do in a brass band? So you don't just play Mozart and Beethoven and and, and that y- you know we, we play a lot of rock and pop music you know like we could, we Don't you could... practice out in Old Bridge I one Sunday I popped out there um, well it was lashing rain unfortunately what's new for Ireland but you had a, you had a, you had a tent and yeah, you, well, you some... have a regular gig over yeah. the summer in Old Bridge at the Battle of the Boyne site and we're actually out there today's Saturday isn't it yeah we're out there tomorrow uh, from half two to half four it's and it's a, lovely, and it's, it is, and yeah, it's, it's free. It's free entry, so yeah. if people want to come along and hear us. And we're out there again the following Sunday. And you practice there. But you won some big competition, didn't you? Didn't we're I see the, that? We're the, we're the current uh, national champions of Ireland, yeah. And um, we, we've quite a track record in that we've won that eight out of the last ten years. And we've also won the North of Ireland championships three or four times in that period so if we've, we've had a good run you know it's a lot of practice i'm sure and a oh, lot yeah, of big commitment work. you know yeah, it's, but it's huge it's a huge yeah. commitment yeah but i'm lucky in that the band's premises we got a new premises there about four or five years ago it's in the east coast business park it's actually very close to where i live it's it's mm. about two minutes drive oh, that's great that's it takes great. about six or seven yeah. minutes to walk there so it's very close and I, but you said there that it, it has expanded your selection your choice of music that you like oh, yeah. all types it and introduces you to everything from from, as I said, from classical music to rock and pop music to, and then there's a lot of sort of contemporary music that's written specifically for brass bands. So, well, is this maybe has influenced your third choice of song, um, Enya? Um, you could tell me why you've chosen that, uh, Anthony. We don't do an awful lot of traditional stuff. Well, we do. We do a certain amount of Irish traditional music that's been arranged for band. We haven't done much Enya. Enya is so unique; it's not really translatable into into the brass sphere but this one is sort of more mythical I suppose it captures for me a lot of the sort of uh, aura and energy around sort of ancient Ireland I think Enya's music in general captures something that's sort of sort of deeply ancestral and it's sort of very hard to explain but um, this one in particular I saw this on an RTE broadcast about Newgrange in 1999 the dawn of the new millennium they did a broadcast from Newgrange mm, She's a haunting type of a it's sound hasn't she? It's beautiful yeah, you know yeah. and she plays the. you'll hear a whistle solo a deep uh, uh, an Irish whistle solo in this and she plays it herself fabulous stuff Fascinating
In case you've just tuned in, you're listening to me, Betty Clark, on my show, Castaways, here in Dundalk FM. And my special guest today is Anthony Murphy uh, from Mythical Ireland. So um, it's lovely to have you and I'm, I'm sure people are enjoying listening to you. Um, tell me about your latest book um, that you have written. Yeah, The Cry of the Sebok. Um, what is, does that mean? That this, a, a Sebok is an old Irish word for a hawk and it's based around a, a sort of a very well, well, a, I was going to say a very well known, well known to those of us who study it, but uh, a sort of a, a, an archetypal ancient myth about Fintan MacBorkra. And Fintan was said to have survived the flood, the great flood that happened. Now, you know, the, the biblical flood of Noah's Ark and all that. Well, we know that there was a global catastrophe because it's recorded in myths around the world, the same sort of story is recorded. And Fintan was said to have survived the flood and how he survived was he turned into a salmon and he swam in the waters until the waters receded and then he became uh, an eagle and then he transformed into a hawk and he comes back you know in various uh, stages of Irish history and he's sort of lived forever basically well almost forever he's said to have lived for 5,000 years and is consulted in some of the myths as a sort of an ancient sage because he's kind of been aware of the whole history of the island of, of Ireland since the earliest times and really what the uh, legend is about is about the survival of ancient wisdom throughout the ages so that you know, men and women come and go and communities grow and die and all the rest. But the knowledge is transported through time and that's what mythology does. It transports the myth through time. And the story is based around that is that a young boy in modern Ireland meets the hawk and the hawk talks to him and brings him on this incredible journey uh, of sort of uh, self-awakening and all that and mm. self-awareness. Mm. It would make a great movie, wouldn't it? Um, I hope so. Yeah, yeah Disney. Are, you know are any we, are we, directors know, there that you know might be interested? There? Throw, yeah, throw I, I, it in oh, their I must make a few calls <laughs> after the show. Direct to Hollywood. But I mean, you know, listening to your story there. I mean, are we talking um, shamanism, a bit yeah. druid? I've, I've, as I said, I've been yeah. over to uh, the Hill of Tara a couple of times. Uh, the solstice. Now, unfortunately, it was always cloudy or foggy or too much sm- sm- smoke. That's Ireland. Very you know. Miss, so, yeah. but I did see lots of people doing drum and banging and you know all kinds of yeah so it's, um, it's sorry for me as a lay person it's quite confusing as to uh, you know are they tribes yeah well I, I i have to be very careful too how i describe my work because y- you know i'm 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 not i'm not um and you know it, people use this term new age you know yeah, which yeah. a it, cult it, it, well in which a, a lot of people are thrown into the same sort of uh bucket as it were and um I don't know, New Age kind of covers a million different things. But in terms of the cry of the Sebok, yeah, I suppose the shaman traditionally would have been seen as somebody who would have been a healer in their community and who who would have sort of encountered their own sort of very serious journey into the the depths and the darkness through their own illness or whatever and recovered from that and then come back and sort of been a sort of a, a, a wise druid of the community and somebody who would have taken people through various initiatory journeys. And I suppose I kind of touch on that in Sebok in that, you know, that's what Finton, I think, represents um, uh, the survival of that and how it can be used in the current scenario. Um, like, And I think actually some of our ancient myths are actually very relevant to today's yeah, Ireland right. and today's yeah. story. Transferable almost. Because they're quite... They're quite pro- prophetic in, in in a sense you know like we in Ireland we have the the invasion mythology which spoke about waves of invasion so you had you know the the, the Namedians and the Furbolog and the Fomorians and the two headed Danon and the Milesians and what ended up happening was that in in the historical um um facet of uh, you know our, our our story as a people that those invasions played out into reality in that we had everything from the Normans and the Vikings and the English. Uh, so what we had in myth actually transcribed into mm. r- reality. And even down to, I wrote about this in my book about Newgrange, even down to the modern time when we had the economic crisis, the sovereignty of Ireland was basically handed over to Europe. And that uh, reflects 
the, the myth of the arrival of the Milesians who wanted to take Ireland from the Tuatha Dé Danann. And the Tuatha Dé Danann actually agreed, after some skirmishes and battling, agreed to give uh, dominion of Ireland to the Milesians. But the Tuatha Dé Danann retreated into the Shi, which were, you know, the mounds in the other world, and allowed the Milesians to have reign, which is a sort of a strange thing to happen, but as I said, reflected in modern history. Well, that's fascinating, um, Anthony. Perhaps that's why you've chosen the fourth song there. It was playing in the background, an epic drama song there, um, Honour Him and Now You Are Free from Gladiator. Yeah. We were just, it, was, it was instrumental, so we've just played that Gladiator there. is sort of one of the modern epics and one of these films that you don't see uh, very often, which encompasses everything from, you know, war and battle to love and romance and loss and death and, you know, the whole sort of heroic epic around how one individual can make such a huge difference to his or her community. So I think it's apt in that regard, yeah. And then a completely different song choice on the fifth song, uh, um, Freddie Mercury, you know, Don't Stop Me Now, which is completely modern and yet uh, ties into what you've... Yeah, and I think this captures some of the real sort of fun spirit of, of Queen and, you know, when they were at their very best, um, uh, you, you know, that I think Mercury probably felt that he himself was unstoppable and he was on a buzz and uh, I think the thing about Queen is that they 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 wouldn't have survived I mean Freddie tried to do a solo thing and, and it just didn't happen for him Queen were very much a sort of a quartet they were a unit in which they all had input into the songs that they created and I think you two are actually very like that in many respects it was actually the Edge who wrote the music for um, the Streets of No Name mm. whereas Bono composed mm. the, the, the so the, the band thing and obviously the brass band and everyone has a part to play yeah. and Queen just like that and I think better. this song epitomises my own sort of belief in in, in that I, I'm very lucky to have the opportunity to live a life and when you see all the conflict and all the stuff that's going on around the world and all the situations that people are in and the political strife and you know famine and all the rest and all the religious wars that are going on we're very lucky in Ireland I think in that we have a relative freedom to speak our mind to do what we like to do to follow our paths in life to follow our bliss and I, I think this song maybe epitomises that that we're you know we can do that. Don't stop me now. Let me sort of live my existence while I can, you know. I'm gonna have myself very good. That's very good. We're into five now. Okay. And the world oh, sorry, sorry. I thought that was the best. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Floating around in ecstasy.
supersonic man out of you. Stop me now. I'm having such a good time. I'm having a ball. Don't stop me now. If you wanna have a good time, just give me a call. Don't stop me now. Don't stop me now. Good time. I don't wanna stop at all. Well, welcome back there w- to uh, me, Betty Clark, on Castaways. And I'm talking here today to a- uh, Anthony Murphy. Anthony, you're a brilliant photographer. I've seen lots of your stuff on Facebook and it's it's. I'm saving up. I'm going to the credit union shortly to get a loan out to get to be able to buy some of your prints. But they're beautiful. How, how do you do it? All joking aside. Um, well, it's believe it or not... Um yeah, it's been a sort of a big hobby of mine for a long time. And in tandem with Mythical Ireland and my interest in the sites, it's kind of really grown. And I've, 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 I have a particular sort of style of photograph that tends to be very sort of atmospheric and very colourful. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the two things really go hand in hand very well. But how it's done, really, Betty, it's very simple. Most of, most of the work is being there at the right time. But don't you do a lot of m- night night clips yeah. with lighting? I've seen I do, beautiful yeah. Mill Mount and the the, the bridge, the yeah. Mary McAleese Bridge. Beautiful. So I'm inclined to take photographs, uh, usually at sunset. I'm not that good at sunrises because usually, like in the summertime, sunrises at five a.m. and like you know you'd want to be mad in the head to be up at that time of the morning. But um, I do a lot of sunsets, dusk, and what we call the blue hour, which is the hour before sunrise and the hour after sunset when you got this real deep blue in the sky and that makes for very colourful very deeply colourful photos what and time What time is that again the blue well, hour? well it, it depends on what 10 time 10 or 11 year, o'clock but, kind but, of thing is it? at this time of year so, sort of between say quarter to 10 now and half 10 that sort okay. of time so there's a different light available to a photographer at that y- time yeah but the thing is if you've got something like a monument it, it has to be lit up otherwise it's just a silhouette so thankfully Newgrange is lit up at night but not very well I, I I actually think that's something that could be could be looked at is is the flood lighting of new granges isn't very imaginative um but yeah I do a lot of that stuff and then nighttime photos but really 90% of the work is just to be there at that right time and the rest is having some sort of a technical knowledge but mm. <clears throat> I think mm. it'd be possible for most people to get really good pictures if yeah. I mean, if you if you got a crowd of people out at Newgrange at sunset I think most of them would capture something sort of yeah, really special. Yeah and I suppose you know? modern phones have become uh, modernised now with great cameras haven't they compared oh, yeah. to say five years ago even oh, compared people Compared to even two or three yeah, years ago yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. possible to get really good pictures on phones now yeah. Yeah, but the but pictures have sort of helped in that they've been used in my books and they help to sort of populate the website and then the whole um the whole social media presence of mythical Ireland is really revolves around the photography as the sort of the the key thing and then the words around that because on social media what you find is with your books you can go into depth but on social media people aren't necessarily looking for depth and they get the woe, woe factor. If they see a picture that they really like, they're inclined to share it. And that's a great way of getting your message yeah. out there. Is well, a picture t- tells a th- is a thousand words, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and you're picture. hoping that you draw people in, that they like your page and that they'll maybe read some of the links that you're sharing. And then, I mean, I write blog posts which would go in deeper, as it were. And they're quite, quite well read. I mean, I, I wrote a post a, a while ago about f- a, f- a folk belief about Newgrange, you know, that uh, basically um, in which the locals seemed to know that some of the stones came from the Mourne Mountains but this was before it was excavated and before we actually knew that as a fact and that has been read 11,000 times oh my so, god you know yeah it's 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 fascinating so the, the pictures are sort of the hook as it were you know to draw people in and then there's all sorts of stuff there's, I mean I've made a lot of video stuff and I'm mm. hoping to do a lot of film work down the line you know I've done a lot of it over the years but I want to do it on a sort of a bigger scale and on a more professional basis you know Well you know that brings us into the movies your love of the uh, music for, for movies so oh, maybe yeah. when you're directing your movie you could, you'll be able to ask uh, your sixth song choice uh, oh, Ennio Morricone you can ask him to do yeah. a sound a, a piece for you you know 
know. So yeah. uh, you've you've chosen this one, Deborah's theme, "Once Upon a Time in America." Yeah, as your sixth song choice. Tell me about that. Yeah, Anthony. Morricone is a kind of a, a, a musical genius. He, he, he's 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 composed all sorts of different music, became famous for the spaghetti western stuff, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, etc, etc, but has done everything in the meantime from the likes of Gabriel's oboe um, to more modern stuff. He's still on the go. The man's yes, in his, I've heard he's him, yeah. in his 80s. Yes, he's, he's he is a genius though, shows. isn't he? Yeah, um, it'd be nice to be able to hire, hire him for, yeah. for an epic production on The Cry of the Sebok, you know, right. get him to do something with a bit of an Irish... We picture that now as we listen to yeah. this song, so that's, that's on your wish list, Anthony. Well, we're coming close to the end of the show. Um, you seem to really like movies, Anthony. You don't yeah. know movie song choices because, I mean, that was that's a very powerful song there, yeah. uh, the last Actually, one. Actually, it's the genre that I probably listen to most, you know, um, in terms of my own personal listening time. I, I, I like listening to movie m- music and theme Me- music. Themes, yeah. And I would have thought years ago that that was a bit odd, but then I've realised over the years that, you know, movie music does have a big, huge, big following. And so you have the likes of Hans Zimmer now, who's who composed Gladiator and other stuff. Uh, Zimmer has s- sort of huge shows around his music now. And there's, 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 there's a reason it's popular, and that's because it's, you know, l- largely co- the music is, for these movies is quite epic and uh, quite brilliant, really, you know. Um, Zimmer and the likes of John Williams and Morricone would be mm. sort of high on my list. Well, John Williams brings us into the, your seventh choice of song, which um, is him to the fall and with private, saving Private Ryan. So tell me about that one, Anthony. Yeah, well, another one that has a, obviously a very strong connection to Ireland in that uh, a lot of the scenes in the early part of the movie were filmed down in the southeast on the beaches um yeah this is this this is hauntingly brilliant this piece of music and uh, williams sort of wrote this as a 
as a sort of a well it's called Hymn to the Fallen obviously you know a, a, a song that is a, a, a musical ode to those who sacrificed you know gave the ultimate sacrifice on the on the beaches of all the great wars but I think it's sort of one of my favourite John Williams pieces of music and uh, incidentally we played it we play an arrangement of this in the brass band that's quite beautiful as well just going to ease back on that and have that playing as we talk to Anthony I have to ask you Anthony you've, you've got a luxury item and a book now to bring with you onto this desert island I, so. I can't believe that you expect me to go to a desert island with just one book seriously um, I, 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 you, you are absolutely forcing me to choose one yes <sighs> it's very hard I, the one I, I wrote down on the list of questions was um, it's called Myth, Legend and Romance which is a collection it's a, basically an encyclopedia of Irish myths by the late Dahi O'Hogan who was a, a, a sort of a leading expert in the field but I mean I, I, I'd get to the end of that and I'd read it and reread it and reread it and I'd, I'd have it off by heart living on a desert island but I'd really like to bring my Kindle so I could bring sort of four or five hundred books so my wife will tell you the you know, I'm a big hoarder of books and a yeah. big reader of books, and you're just like you know, looking at, a huge at the books. Library at yeah, home, basically, yeah. you know. And would you ever read the, a book the second time now at home? Would you? Um, yeah, what? but what I would do with a lot of non-fiction stuff is I would dip in and out of uh, books quite a bit, looking for information that's relevant to Snippets. what I'm sort of researching at the time. Yeah. So the, there'd always be five or six books sitting on the desk at any sort of given time. And tell me about your luxury item now. I was interested in this one. Uh, yeah, that would be a ham radio transceiver. Um, solar panelled, of well, course. Well, of course, if I'm on a powered. desert island, I'd have to have some sort of solar panels or a wind turbine to power it, you know. And that's another hobby of yours, this um, ham radio. radio. So, yeah. amateur, tell me about that. What what uh, does that? It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's a, 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 a hobby where you basically uh, make contacts with other radio amateurs around the world and it's uh, fantastic because you just use your own uh, radio and your own antenna to make a contact with someone on the other side of the world you're not it's not like where you make a phone call where you're using uh, infrastructure involving you know under sea cables and satellites and all the rest it's just you and your antenna and him and his antenna and uh, you can talk in voice or you can use morse code or you can use digital modes over a computer so it's uh, quite a fascinating hobby i've been Sort of no, no music, just years. all talking. Yeah, no, we can't. We're not allowed to play music. Yeah, we're we're yeah. licensed. We're actually we're licensed by Comreg, the uh, Department of Communications. You have to get a license. You have to study and you have to know what you're at, uh, basically. But it is quite fascinating. There's about 1,500 licensed radio amateurs in Ireland. There's about 2.5 million around the world. 
Oh God, that's yeah. yeah, that's like a little community, is it? Yes, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a radio society in Dundalk based on the Castletown Road, and we meet uh, every, twice a month. And it's, there's quite a social side to it as well. So it's not just about radio and the technical yeah. side. We meet and have tea and eat buns and all that sort of stuff. And, and chat. chat. Yes. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of another Castaway show. And I'd, I'd like to thank my special guest, Anthony Murphy, this time. It's been very interesting and um I've enjoyed it, all the music choice. So I hope you've all enjoyed the show. And don't forget to tune in again the next time with Castaways uh, with me, Betty Clark, on Dundalk FM. But f- just to play us out, we're going to finish with uh, Anthony Murphy's eighth song choice, and it's You Too, The Unforgettable Fire. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks very much for having me. And if you want to know more, it's mythicalireland.com is the website, or facebook.com forward slash mythicalireland. the end of castaways with myself betty clark i hope you've enjoyed the show join me again next time on castaways with betty clark on dundalk fm